welcome everybody. It's a little awkward, I'm kind of in the middle here. We have both levels filled and I'm just thrilled about that. And I want to welcome you to our ninth, I believe, annual Hilt auction. One of the great events at the law school. And I think, well, I'll talk about why I believe that. But the opportunities that this presents are just stunning. And uh, uh, I'm so happy that everybody is here. I just want to do first things first. I want to thank the students. And I want to thank not only the film chairs, Catherine Kreider and Natasha De Silva, but all of the students that have worked tirelessly on film and related issues all semester, and some of you have been at it for two years. Thanks to the Dean's office, but really to the students who inspire us and remind us of the good work that we can all do. So can we hear it for the students? Please? And of course, I'm uh, honored and thrilled to welcome uh, David Boyce. He will be uh, formally introduced by Catherine. But I want to tell you the uh, just a short story about the David Boyce that I knew and have reacquainted myself with. And his influence on me, an influence I'm sure he has no clue of or in fact no memory of. But let me take you to Jackson, Mississippi in 1967, 233 North Farish Street, the home of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, run by a wonderful attorney who was the head of legal services in St. Louis, uh, Denny Bray. And when you walked in the front door, there was an office to the right, the first office, as I recall, David. And if I have this right, there were two young lawyers in that office at the time. One was David Boys, and the other was another wonderful lawyer from New York, Jonathan Shapiro. And I was a first year law student at Berkeley. And the only thing I wanted to do was go south in 1967. And when I got there, here was David Boys, who was at that time with Cravath, if I recall correctly. And David, I don't think you realize the impact that you had on the many law students that were there that summer. It was an exciting summer. It was a sometimes dangerous summer. It was an always inspiring summer. And one of the things that inspired us most was seeing really, really smart, great lawyers who were making a living and starting out on what would become an incredibly successful career but at the same time reminding us that you can, in fact, do good as you do well, and that there was a path to follow that, in fact, would satisfy and fulfill our dreams of why so many of us went to law school at that time, and I dare say now. So David, uh, all these years I've watched your career, and I want you to know that it's been an inspiration. It was an inspiration then and continues to be one now. Catherine will introduce Mr. Boyes to you. I want to introduce David Boyes to our institution and to our students. This is a wonderful law school, and I just want to make three very brief points. First, we take our mission seriously. We talk about change the world from here. And those are not just words, it's not just a tagline. The actions we take as an institution are focused on training skilled, ethical, professional, engaged lawyers who can make a difference in the world. Second, we reject the notion that there are too many lawyers in the world. Ask somebody, seriously, ask somebody on death row whether there are too many lawyers in the world. 
Go down to the Tenderloin, somebody who's in a rent dispute, and ask them if there are too many lawyers in the world. There will never be too many lawyers in the world as long as lawyers are dedicated to the common good and fostering the rule of law. And the third point I want to make is about our faculty. We understand that for the law students, it's a privilege to have a legal education. With that privilege comes their responsibility to study, to become engaged, to be ethical lawyers. But we as faculty also have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to create opportunities for our students, as this auction does tonight. And finally, I want to introduce our students to David Boyce. This is an incredibly diverse, smart, group of students who we are very proud of. And it's no secret that right now we're in the middle of some very difficult times. A difficult job market, escalating student debt. We understand that and we're struggling to overcome it. But you know where we look at this institution for inspiration about how to keep on going, how to keep on keeping on? We look at our students. We watch our students work in the clinics. We watch our students work on war crimes tribunals in Phnom Penh. We watch our students go to five southern states to work on uh, representing death row inmates. And we watch our PILF grantees fan out all over California and sometimes all over the country as they go about their good work. So whether it's St. Anthony's Kitchen and serving a meal, or working on a law reform project in Vietnam, our students remind us that there's a generation that cares and will take up the charge. And that's why this is so important in our creation. I just want to make uh, two additional points. One is an apology, and the other is uh, uh, related to the reason we're here. And I, uh, David, you know, I, for 45 years, I've been meaning to apologize to you for something. I used to think I played bridge, and I have no idea how to play bridge now, but in 1967 in July, uh, David and his wife coaxed me into going to the Mississippi State Bridge Tournament, and I was the third hand, and they were great bridge players, and I think I single-handedly <laughs> lost that tournament for you, and my apologies. <laughs> My final point before Catherine comes up is this. We have a responsibility to create opportunity. And the truth is, without cash, you can't create opportunity. And tonight, this is about raising money. And I thank our alums and our Board of Governors who are here and other uh, uh, friends of the law school. And I'm asking people tonight, to remember why we're here. We're here to create opportunities for students to, act, to do the good works that brought them to this institution in the first place. So please, bid often, dig deep, spend <laughs> money. These two guys and their whole crew uh, have just been wonderful. Catherine Kreider and Natasha. So. Thank you so much, Dean Brand. Good evening. On behalf of myself and my fellow co-chair, Natasha De Silva, I would like to introduce the recipient of this year's USF School of Law Public Interest Excellence Award. Mr. David Boyce. Mr. Boyce was selected as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and the runner-up person of the year for Time Magazine. He was also named Litigator of the Year by the American Lawyer, Lawyer of the Year by the National Law Journal, and the Antitrust Lawyer of the Year by the New York Bar Association. Clearly, this is an individual whose accomplishments are vast. Mr. Boyce served as Chief Counsel and Staff Director of the United States Senate Antitrust Subcommittee in 1978 and was Chief Counsel and Staff Director of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee in 1979. In 1986, representing the Democratic National Committee, 
He won a permanent injunction prohibiting the Republican National Committee from targeting minority districts with efforts to challenge voter qualifications. Mr. Boyes was also counsel to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, recovering $1.2 billion from companies who sold junk bonds to failed savings and loans associations. From 1998 to 2000, he served as special trial counsel for the United States Department of Justice in its antitrust suit against Microsoft. Mr. Boyes also served as the lead counsel for former Vice President Al Gore in connection with litigation relating to the 2000 election Florida vote count. As co-lead counsel for the plaintiffs in Perry v. Brown, he won judgments establishing the constitutional right to marry for gay and lesbian citizens in California in the federal district and appellate courts. It is for this impressive litigation work and his passion for civil rights in particular that we would like to honor Mr. Boyce tonight. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David Boyce. to no man 
will we sell justice? The idea was that we would take the, the justice system and place it beyond corruption, that people would be able to expect from the courts a fair result regardless of who they were. And there is a sense today in which every lawyer, or almost every lawyer, um, has to ask their clients in private practice, how much justice can you afford? Because when you interview a client and you listen to a client's problem, far too often we have to think to ourselves, does this client really have the resources to do this case? How much justice can this client afford? Can this client afford a partner or just a couple of associates? An expert or do we have to get by without an expert? How many depositions can we take? And the more often we have to make those kinds of decisions, the more we are saying in effect, we will never out loud. How much justice can you afford? And to make our legal system work better, and it will never work perfectly, no adversarial system, no system of justice ever is going to work perfectly. But to make it better, to make it as good as it can be, and as good as we can make it, we've got to find more and more ways to reduce the effect of that imbalance of resources that exists. One of them are people who are prepared to make the sacrifices that are necessary to devote themselves to public interest work. Another way is for lawyers who go to work for large law firms to devote a substantial amount of their time to pro bono activities. Another way is to get our judges to begin to exercise control over litigation costs because it is the lack of control over litigation costs that gives one side or the other the ability to engage in this arms race in which you're taking more depositions, having more witnesses, more experts, in which, and it is that in that kind of arms race that the less well-resourced party falls farther and farther behind. Now, a number of judges, including judges in California are making some important steps to trying to curtail litigation expenses and litigation activity, particularly in smaller cases and particularly in cases where one side or the other um, lacks adequate resources to really engage fully in a widespread uh, litigation battle. So that's a better supervision by the, um, by the courts is, is an important element. Better funding from the legislature in terms of funding um, not only the court system, which we increasingly need to fund around this country, um, but also to fund uh, public services, f public legal services, so that you have not only public defenders for criminal prosecutions, but individuals who are prepared to represent at state expense people who do not have the capacity to find representation for themselves in serious civil uh, events. It is hard to talk budgets to legislatures. Um, a few months ago, Ted Olson and I uh, went to the California legislature to try to testify in favor of expanded uh, funds from courts. And I think we made some progress. But it is still the case if you go down to Superior Court in this city, you have to pay for your own court reporter. If you can't pay for your own court reporter, you don't get a transcript. If you don't get a transcript, you can't appeal. A fundamental element of justice is the equality that comes from having an opportunity to have the same rights in court as anybody else. And one of those rights is the right to appeal. And without a transcript, no appeal. Without the money to pay for it, no transcript. So in the context 
have court closings and the inability to uh, provide even basic uh, elements of the judicial system, like transcripts, trying to get funding for public services to people who can't afford them, public legal services to people who can't afford them, is a challenging uh, endeavor. It is one that I hope we will make progress on, but until we do, it's critically important that lawyers, young and old, do what they need to do to help make this justice system work. Every one of you in this room who become a lawyer will have an opportunity to make a good living. What is important is that you remember, as Dean Brand said in a different context a few minutes ago, what brought you here in the first place. People come to law school fundamentally because they believe in the justice system. Um, it's an exciting profession. It's a well-regarded profession. It is a profession that is well uh, paid, uh, generally, compared to other things. Um, but there are other easier ways to make a living. There are other ways to make more money. Um, people come to a law school initially because, most, most of us, because we're interested in justice. You will find that interest is hard to sustain over the next 10, 15 years. Because what will happen is you will have other responsibilities. You will have to get married, you have to have a family, you have to have a mortgage to pay, car payments to make, children to educate. You will have all sorts of both financial and time responsibilities. And from personal experience, I can tell you that it's very easy to lose sight of the justice part in the justice system because you're focusing so much on what you're doing that you're forgetting what brought you to the law in the first place. And so I would say try to remember as you go forward and try to remind the people around you and try to remind the older people who may have forgotten what brought us all to this profession in the first place which is the idea that we could make a difference, that we could change the world by making the world more just, that we could make the world a place where there was less discrimination, that we could make the world a place where there was less poverty, that we could make the world a place where there was less of a difference between the quality of justice that poor people got and the quality of justice that rich people got. That we as lawyers would have to ask ourselves and implicitly our clients less and less how much justice can we afford. Thank you. Since Natasha and Catherine and the students did all the work, I'd like them to formally present the award, but I would just like to uh, thank David for those incredibly inspiring words. Um, it, you know, it's just a remarkable career, the Proposition 8 trial, of course, being stunning, but so many other uh, inspiring moments along the way. So David, we thank you, and Catherine. The 2012 Public Interest Law Foundation Award for Public Interest Excellence goes to David Boyce in recognition of his outstanding contributions to the struggle for equality, peace, and justice.